Hey everyone, Ashton here, and welcome back to Precision Horology. Today we have a pretty exciting project that we're going to embark on together. Uh, we need to make a return bar, or a yoke as it's sometimes called, for a special Longines pilot watch. Now it's the 1938 uh, Longines Magetic pilot watch that we're going to be making it for. Uh, the watch came to me with the yoke actually snapped in half. Now I've looked everywhere to try and find one of these uh, and it's an impossible thing to find. Uh, none of my suppliers uh, can come up with anything. There was a different style of return bar or yoke that was used. Um, I'm not sure why Longines did this for the caliber 15.94. Uh, I could get one of those, but unfortunately, I can't get the style that I need. So we're going to be making together uh, a yoke, trace out the old broken part, um, and cut it out of a piece of sheet steel. We're going to cut it out, drill out the areas we need to, harden and temper it, and then finally put it into the watch. So let's get going, and uh, we can make this yoke together. Well, first off, we can talk a little bit about what a yoke or a return bar is uh, and exactly what function it has in a watch. Uh, it's this piece that's hidden underneath here. Um, we can see we're moving the sliding pinion or the clutch pinion back and forth. The return bar or the yoke does what it says. It returns the sliding pinion to the correct position. So basically, it helps to move the sliding pinion forward so that we can engage the correct components to set the time. And then it moves the sliding pinion back so that we can engage the correct components to wind the watch. So it's an integral part of the watch movement. Uh, it's a small, relatively simple part, but it is an integral part nonetheless so that we can wind the watch and set the time correctly. So here is our culprit. It's our broken return bar um, that was in the watch, and we can see that it's snapped here in the middle. Now, the interesting thing about this is there is no real reason for this extra foot to be here. This would normally engage with our setting lever, but the way our return bar is set up is that it sits here like this and this would sit across like this but there's no need for this um, foot here because it doesn't engage against it so it's very thin where the two components join here which really leads me to believe that this isn't correct um, it looks like something that someone's uh, soldered together or maybe even tried to stick together with glue because I don't see a lot of solder marks um, either way, pretty, pretty sure it's not correct. Um, based on the way the actual main plate looks, um, it appears that it would sit at more of an angle. Um, it wouldn't sit straight across. It appears to me that it would sit more like, more, uh, put it on the right part, up and then come back down. Whereas this, not really sure. It's possible that they even didn't put it together. It's possible that they just put it in the watch loose like this, hoping it would work. Um, and that would explain why when the watch came in, uh, you couldn't set the time. You couldn't put it into hand setting position. So we won't be able to work off our old component. This section, again, I believe is correct. This section, not. So uh, we'll have to get a little more creative and try and find out exactly what our original setting lever looked like. And for that, we can head to the archives. We can see we have the best fit identification book here, and we have our Longines 15.94. Now these are actually photocopies. Uh, this book is from the 60s, actually from the 50s, I believe. And these are photocopies of actual components. Um, this book is indispensable when it comes to vintage watch restoration. Uh, so we can see that Yes, it is correct. That is the way that the original part sits on. But if we put our component on, we can see that it doesn't follow at all. We can see that it goes, it cuts back and then comes off. 
So we'll trace out our original part. Um, and then what we can do is use our guide, keep coming back to our best fit book to make sure that we're um, filing everything to the right shape and size. So this has really helped us that we've been able to look this up and find out what the original component would have looked like so that we can bring the watch back to its original, uh, original restored state. So what do we do? Well, we start big with our sheet steel, our 0.8 millimeter sheet steel, and then we get smaller. Cut it to a rough shape, we'll drill our center hole, and then we can file to size. So at this point, we cut our sheet steel down to our rough square size that we need it. Then we file it flat, we draw file it flat to bring our overall uh, thickness down of the steel. The next thing we need to do is drill the hole that will be used, and then we can clean up the hole to make sure that we remove any burrs that have left by the drill. Now we can ream out the hole because we didn't uh, drill it to complete size. We slowly ream it out so that we get the exact size needed uh, for where our screw goes in. And we use a final smoothing brooch just to clean up any uh, marks left by the cutting brooch uh, in, that, uh, in that hole there. Now we clean up the hole again just by countersinking and removing any final burrs that were left there by the uh, final reaming. And now we check the screw to make sure our screw fits in and we have a good engagement of the screw. As I mentioned, we had no part to work off. So what we do is we photocopy a piece from the best fit book and we're actually gonna cut out that component so that we can put it onto the steel uh, and trace out the component based on that picture. So we have our cutout completely uh, ready to go. Now what we can do is we can put it on top of the steel um, just to see what it looks like, see how we're going to mount it, uh, make sure that our holes line up, and just check to make sure uh, everything's as it should be. So we now have our paper cut out glued to the steel, and we've made sure that our two holes line up, the hole in the steel and the hole in the paper, so that we know we're getting the precise uh, exact measurements that we need to. So what we're going to do at this point is we're going to start filing. We're going to take away uh, metal from the outside so we can get our rough outline and our rough shape of our return path. So first we start with our heavy rough filing to remove the bulk of the material before we work our way down to our finer files. We can see here we're using a flat file and then to get our rounded shape we start to use a half round file so that we can follow the contours of the return bar and remove the steel in roughly the right shape that we need. Here we can see we're starting to really take shape. Uh, we're getting a good outline of our return bar. We've removed a nice amount of material at this point. Now we can start with our finer files uh, as we get closer to our actual size and our actual dimensions, making sure to go slowly and carefully so that we don't overshoot how much steel we need to remove uh, and leave enough room for finishing and final draw filing. So here we can see we have one side pretty much cut out, but pretty much to the rough shape that our picture um, has put us at, and we can turn the piece over and we can start filing the other side of the workpiece. So the same procedure as the other side of the return bar, we start with our heavier files to remove bulk material, and then we work our way down to our smaller needle files so that we can get the exact shape that we need to, making sure we follow the contours, follow the uh, twists and turns as it were, to make sure that we have the right shape for our return bar. As you can see, we use a variety of different needle files, probably around half a dozen or so, so that we can use the right file for the right application and get the final shape that's desired. As we can see, uh, our next side is almost complete. We're nearly down to the uh, exact dimensions that we need to be as far as the paper is concerned. Now we can file the very tip to the right shape. And we have our rough outline. We can see that we've filed the steel to the dimensions of the picture, but it's still been left oversized at this point. But this does give us a good opportunity to check the engagement, the initial engagement in the watch. So we can see that the component is still oversized, but it fits, 
uh, it's looking like it's the correct shape and we can see that engagement is starting to take shape uh, and we've followed the right course of action um, with the outline. So we can see that at this point we are looking pretty good with regards to our engagement. So at this point we can get to our final finish filing. Removing material and checking the component in the watch as we go to make sure that we're removing everything from the right places and really making sure the piece will fit this individual movement. Making sure that all our shapes, everything is even, everything's in the right spot so that we can get the best engagement possible when uh, the keyless work is set up. So with the right shape brought to our component, we need to now bring the overall thickness of it down and we do this by gluing it to the bolt tool and grinding it flat on a diamond stone. Here we can see it's set to be flat on the bolt tool. We move it back and forth across the diamond stone so that we can get the overall diameter down to that 0.5 of a millimeter thickness that we desire. So now we're at the right thickness. We can just make sure that we remove all those burrs from the edges and really finish off the edges nicely um, for a good engagement. We can see that the return bar is now pretty much complete. At this point, we need to harden and temper it because we've been using carbon steel that hasn't been hardened, uh, so it's easier to work with. Now, if we were to put this in the watch, uh, it could potentially bend and it wouldn't have those hard properties that we need. So we're gonna harden it and then we're gonna temper it so that we can make sure that the uh, part can function for years to come without bending or warping. So we have a component wrapped with binding wire. You can see it's all wrapped up. Um, wrapping it up helps to, when we heat it up cherry red and then quench it in our water solution to, to harden it. There's a risk of it uh, bending because it's a small component and has uh, pieces cut out. So this just really helps us to um, not uh, uh, not have the component bend, uh, but it also helps to create a bit of a mass so that uh, it retains its heat quicker. Uh, sorry, it retains its heat for longer because what happens is because it's such a small piece, um, it loses its heat very quickly and we need it to be hot when we plunge it into the uh, cooling solution to harden it. Unfortunately, I'm not gonna be able to get the hardening process uh, on video, but uh, we'll come back once we're all hardened and tempered, ready for final finish finishing. So at this point, our return bar is completed. We've finished our final polishing on the, on the return bar. And we've gone for a nice straight grain finish, we can see, um, and, uh, and we're good to install in the watch and check at this point to see uh, that everything's functioning as it should. So we're gonna go get to, get to uh, assembling the movement um, and then we can check our, check our engagement of our return bar. And there we have it, our completed return bar doing its job uh, inside the completed watch. We can see that we're able to wind the watch and then we're able to pull the crown out, set the time in the hand setting position and our return bar is moving our sliding pinion back and forth so thanks for joining us today and watching this uh, video of how we go about custom making a component such as a return bar for a vintage watch when parts are no longer available. Uh, if you've enjoyed the video, please like the video, uh, please subscribe to the channel, uh, tell your friends about it that might have an interest in watchmaking or horology. Uh, you can also follow us on Instagram at precision underscore horology uh, and you can check out my website precisionhorology.com and have a look at our other YouTube videos as well. So thanks again for watching guys and we'll see you in the next video.